Good evening. Let's start our service together by standing together and singing this hymn, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, blessed be the name of the Lord, the glories of my God and King. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He breaks the power of canceled sin. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His blood can make the foulest clean. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Thank you for that. You can be seated. At this time, our ushers are going to come forward and take our evening offering. And I'm going to ask Brother Sam to please bless the offering. Amen. You can remain seated. Sing these courses with us. Voices only sing this. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Amen. Thanks for that. We're continuing our message and, and, uh, about the Philippians, but before we really even get deep into the, and I understand I've already been in this three or four weeks, but where the Philippian church started in Acts chapter 16, and uh, we're in verse 22 through verse 40, but you remember where we left off last week, we, we talked about they had just got to, so let, let's just start reading in verse 25. They're in the jail, they're in the prison, they, they've been beaten, they're in stocks, they're in bonds. We, we went into great detail about that earlier. So you, you see where they're at. 
But then while they're in the stocks and the bonds, it said, and at midnight, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And by the way, God heard that. Uh, I need to point that in. It got, God heard. And then it says, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so at the foundation of the prison was shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and every man's bonds were loosed. Keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, drew out his sword, would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Call for light, sprang in, came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, brought them out, said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's, some, that's, that's, that's some, one of the most important phrases in that a person can say. What must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Boy, Paul's prophesying there. Paul's saying, If somebody really gets saved, they're going to be influential uh, to those that they love. And that's what happened in this case. Well, they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. He took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his. I don't want to read too much of this, but I'm not reading too much of this. He and his whole family got saved, and they all got baptized. Right. I mean, it, it's right there. And when they brought them into the house and set meat before him and, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Wow. Okay, I'm going to stop off reading there. We talked to you about the persecution. We talked to you about the praise, and my goodness, I enjoyed last Wednesday night just talking about the praise and what took place in, in the prison house. But tonight, I want to talk to you about the power, and then we're going into the, to the, to another sermon. We're going to do all that at the same time. But let, let's talk about the power we see here. And in, in verse 26, it's saying, and suddenly there was a great earthquake. Now, they were, they were praying and singing praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them, but God heard them. Now, I believe that God must have heard their singing and started tapping his foot. And when God started tapping his foot, an earthquake happened. I, I thought that was good myself. God was tapping his foot to the praises of his people and uh, an earthquake ensued. And everyone there knew it was God. Now listen, these guys are praying and sing. Now, they wasn't just singing. They wasn't singing gloom, despair, and agony on me. They were singing praises unto God. And God heard them. Everybody else heard them. And therefore, when an earthquake came, then everybody there knew that it come from God Almighty. Everyone knew. And, and the prisoners knew it. The jailer knew it. And, and he fell on his knees and asked that important question, what must I do to be saved? Now, folks, as we look at this, in verse 31, the simple answer, he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. See, this plan, it's gloriously simple, but simply glorious. That's what this salvation deal is. It's, it's gloriously simple, but it's also simply glorious. The fact that the jailer asked how to be saved, now, now, now listen, I'm not trying to read into this, and, and by the way, I guess if you feel like I am, then you can just not, not say amen. But, but, but the, the jailer asked how to be saved, it tells me that Paul has already been witnessing to the dude. I mean, where'd he get the word saved from? He'd never heard the word saved. He, he's, he's over here where the gospel had never been preached. The, the, this is Europe, folks. This is where we came from, or you came from. I was already here as an Indian. But the, this is where all the rescue people came from, uh, from Europe. And this is the first time the gospel had been preached in Europe. So they didn't know the lingo. They didn't know the terminology. But here this guy that's a pagan says, what must I do to be saved, to get what you've got? I have a feeling he didn't stop preaching because he was arrested. 
And he likely used illustrations of the blood as his own blood dripped. He got beaten and, and his back was bloody. I believe he used that to talk about the precious blood of Jesus. And he told of Jesus beating as he received his beating and talked about the gates of hell being unlocked and captivity being led captive as he was being locked up in a cell. And then God worked in power and broke that toughened jailer's heart. Remember, that's our title, a toughened heart. He broke his heart. He hit bottom thinking he'd be executed and was going to die. And then he was shot to heights. He hit rock bottom and then just in a moment was raised up to, to heights sublime, realizing he was okay. And God had done all this for him to be saved. Now, now, hey, that'd be a lot to, to put in your pipe and smoke. And, and, I mean, that, hey, you mean these guys got arrested, these guys got beat, these got all this stuff, the revival, and, the, and, the, and all this was done so I could get saved. And, folks, I believe that with all my heart. I believe God would go. Listen, I believe if Jesus had to come and died just for you, he'd have still come and died just for you. I believe that's how much he cares and loves for each individual. I believe he loves us that much. And this is exactly what happened here. Even today, the hard cases get serious when they're flat on their back and then they look up. You ever know anybody like that? Guys are hard. They don't want to hear about the gospel. They don't want to hear about Jesus. But you let them get in a hospital bed. You, 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 you let them have several IVs being hooked up to them. And you have the doctor over there looking at his chart, shaking his head and looking for Lauren. Many times in my short life, I've seen that. Uh, and, and where that all of a sudden somebody that wouldn't look up, now they're forced to look up. Anybody here ever had that happen to you? You get knocked down. It, buddy, it happened to me. I said there wasn't a God. I had no regard for God, no regard for Christianity. No, don't you come pre? I remember one time pouring a, uh, slapping a guy down and pouring b beer all over him. That just told me about Jesus. Yeah, I was a nice fella. But understand this. By the way, he's one of the first guys I went to and I got saved. And said, thank you for witness to me. And I sure apologized to him for what I'd done. But I want you to understand, until that woman walked out on me, until that woman right there said, I can't live like this, until that woman said, hey, my dad was a drunk and, 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 I, live, and I can't live like this. I'm not going to marry somebody like you. Well, that knocked me down. Hallelujah. It caused me there in a split second. I got knocked down, but bless God, 10 minutes later, I got lifted up. And God changed my life. But what I'm trying to get you to see that even the hard cases, this man was a hard case. And we're talking about friend day this week. There's hard cases out there that every one of you know. That guy that has no regard. That guy that's a reprobate. That guy that, that's perverse. That, that guy that's got all kinds of problems. That's just the guy we're looking for. That's just the one that Jesus came to die for. Is people that are hard cases. Oh, that, that's what this is all about. The, and by the way, he looked up. He got saved. The jailer got baptized. He started doing good works. And he tried to make restitution. He told his household and they got saved and they got baptized. He put those stripes on their backs and now he's washing those same stripes. He deprived them of food and now he's feeding them. Oh, isn't it marvelous what Jesus does? Amen. See, when you, you know what I see in this also? When you really get saved, you really get changed. If you really get saved, you really get changed. Oh, I didn't say that when you get saved, you become perfect because that would be a lie. But I want you to understand, when God saved my wretched soul, there was a change in my life. There was a change in my outlook. There was a change in my attitude. And my friend, if you say that you're saved and there's not been a change in you, then I, for one, which little old me am not the judge, but I, for one, would doubt if you really got saved. Come to Jesus. He'll change your life. 
This guy got chains. Nobody's so hard that God can't soften them up and save them. This proves that. There's one day a soldier on a battlefield, he, he was dying on the battlefield. The chaplain knelt beside him and told him that he said, son, you're not going to make it. You're going to die. And, and he asked if he could do anything for him uh, on his dying, uh, in his dying few minutes. And the young man had led a wicked life and done a lot of things that he had not done, hurt a lot of people and, 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 and really hurt some of them badly. And, and he said, sir, there's nothing anybody can do for me right now. What I need is somebody who can undo some things for me. Well, they, the first time I've read that, that spoke volumes to me. Sir, there's nothing that you can do for me, but what I'm looking for is somebody that can undo some things for me. Is that what you're needing tonight? Maybe somebody in this crowd. Jesus is the answer. In fact, he's the only one that can undo. He's the only one that can give you a new start. He's the only one that can give you a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance. Oh, my friend, his name is Jesus, and that's what he wants to do for you. Many stumble over salvation, not because it's difficult, but because it's easy. Jesus did the hard part. You know what? There's a lot of people not saved because it's easy. Really, I mean, if you said, well, if, if you would just pay. By the way, there are groups that practice this. Pay some money and you can get absolution for your sin. Right. Do a deed and you can get absolved. But you know what? Jesus says, just believe here. Paul gave the gospel in a nutshell. He said, believe in Jesus, you can be saved. That's right. Simple. Simplistic. But a lot of people stumble over that. You mean G just coming and saying, God, I'm sorry for my sins. God, forgive me. Lord, I believe you're the same. That, that's a yes. He didn't say bring your checkbook. He, he, he didn't say do a bunch of stuff or stop uh, quitting a bunch of stuff. He, no, that's not. Hey, he didn't tell that jailer. Hey, I guarantee you this jailer had some bad habits. But do you see anywhere where Paul mentioned all that? Paul said, okay, buddy, don't smoke, don't chew, and don't run with girls that do. But, but, but hey, no, he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, now shalt be saved. It's not difficult. It's J Jesus did the hard part. Jesus did the hard work. And he said in verse 31, and they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. That carries some commitment. You'll notice he was baptized not because he had to be baptized to get saved, but because he had been saved and wanted to follow the Lord obediently. That's why you get baptized, which is what we all should want to do. Now, go in your Bibles. Keep your Bibles open there. We're, we're, we're going on a, a little further tonight. We're going to talk to you about muddy waters. Muddy waters. You say, what, what is that going to tell you? Well, we'll see. Verse 25 through verse 32 they prayed, sang praises, and prisoners heard them. The earthquake came and shook the prison, and everybody's doors were opened. And everybody, by the way, if you, this is something that gets overlooked. Did you see that not only did the doors open, but their, but their bands, their chains were also loosed? I mean, there's a whole bunch of miracle stuff going on here. We just read over it sometimes and don't pay no attention. Foundations were shaken. And, 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 they, and the keeper of the prison waking up out of sleep, seeing the prison doors open, drew out his sword, wanted to kill himself, supposed that the prison men fled. Paul cried loud for it, do not accept no harm, for we are all here. As I told you last week, th this is one of my favorite parts of the whole deal. There was murderers in there. There was rapists in there. There was thieves in there. There was all kinds of prisoners filling up that prison. But because these guys had heard Paul and Silas praying and preaching and praising God, when their bonds got broken their, and their doors of the prison was open, none of them left. That's one of the biggest things I see in this whole passage. Amen. None of them left. My friend, when we get to the point at our church where the Holy Ghost is breaking bonds and shaking foundations. Woo, 
Oh, when we get to the point at Jacksonville where the presence of God is so strong and where God's tapping his foot to the praise and where God is moving in here where people say, well, where I told you last week, I've seen it happen where people don't want to leave because God is there, because his presence is there. And that's exactly what happened in the prison that night when, when all this was taking place. Do yourself no harm. Nobody's left. Then the guy says, what do we do to be saved? Well, Paul and Silas, uh, they go to Philippi to start the first church in Europe. First time the gospel has been preached to the Gentiles. And they need to formulate their presentation. These people are a whole lot different from the Jews. They aren't locked in the grip of the law, and they're not locked in the grip of religion. They're gripped by the chains of sin and unbelief, if anything at all. And, and that they, they need to hear about God. They need to hear how to be saved. They need a clear presentation. And they got it, a clear presentation. For years later, listen, listen. Years later, when Paul is in another prison in Rome, writing a letter back to the Philippians, which became the book of Philippians, Overall, the book, he said that the church was doing well years later. Let me ask you a question. Here's what I want to get to you tonight. Here's the thought. If you had a child that was lost and you had the, the, the chance to get a message to that child, telling them what to do and how to get home, would you want to make that message simple or complicated? So it is with our soul salvation. Our God wants us all to be home. In fact, did you realize that, 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 that the Word of God says He's not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance? I mean, did you know that about our God? He don't want anybody to be lost. He don't want anybody to go to hell. He wants everybody in this building, everybody in the sound of my voice. He wants us all to be saved. Everybody listening to me uh, over the airways. He wants everybody to be saved. And, 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 and in Acts chapter 16, a man asked, what must I do to be saved? And I'm happy to report to you that God has made it simple. Simple enough for a child to understand. I mean, my wife's going to get mad at me saying this, but uh, she's been. <laughs> I'm sorry, people. See, the disrespect and the lack of submission that we see here. I'm working on it. I've been working on it 50 years trying to get her in line. Uh, simple. My wife came and spoke to the elementary chapel the other day. Some 200 kids we have in elementary. And I, about 35 of them came forward. But listen, now, is she a preacher? No, she's not a preacher. She's just te teaching less to the kids is, is what I believe. But, 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 but understand this. It's simple. It's not complicated. Matthew 18, verse 2 says, Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. And he said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. And whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged around his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Now, what do you think Jesus is saying? He said, you're making it too hard. Jesus said, it's simple. He said, even these little guys can understand. Even these little, he, he said, except you become like them and, be, and have a heart of faith and have a heart of following and, 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 and have a heart of service and, and, and all these things. He said, you've got to become like them. Isaiah 35, 8, speaking of the king's highway to heaven, he said, and a highway shall be there and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, and it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools, should not err therein. You ever read that verse and thought about what it says? You know what it says? It means a stranger without good sense. 
can find his way on the gospel road. That's, that's what it says. It don't take a rocket scientist to be saved. It don't take, by the way, one, I, I, we're going to have a good crowd here Sunday. We're going to have a bunch of lost people. You know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to preach on the eschatological view of the book of Revelation. That's right. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. There may be a place for that. Maybe someday I'll find a place for that. But I'm not going to stand before these people that, that are coming here. Uh, I, I'm not going to tell them and, and, and tell them about the beast in the book of Revelation. Like I told you Sunday, my grandson said, what are these beasts? So I got a far away look in my eye, put my glasses down. So I look like a theologian and I said, they're beast. Simplicity. A lot of people are not saved today because we made it too hard. By the way, let me tell you, you know, I'm a conservative. You know that don't have to say that, but how many of y'all have ever ate? I'm eating, use proper English. How many of you people have ever eaten a fish before you caught it and cleaned it? How, before you, listen, you got to catch them before you clean them. I never have tried to clean one while it's still out there in the water running free. You got to catch him first. And then once you catch him, then, yeah, we'll get him cleaned. But same way with the church. We have a tendency as a church sometimes to look at people out there and say, well, I don't know about them. They don't look like you. They don't dress like you. They don't talk like you. They don't go the same places you do. They don't run around the same people you do. You say, bless God, you know, that, that fish is not for here. Well, I'm going to tell you what, we need, to, we need to catch him and let God clean him. Okay, that, that, that's another message, but we'll, we'll talk about that later sometime. But some, some conservatives, like, like we are, sometimes we want it, people to get cleaned up before we get them in the boat. Yeah. I mean, we, we've got, what, what, several thousand Marines around. Have you all noticed that? We've got several of those running around here. Uh, I... I go to restaurants in Jacksonville where they're at, and they need to be cleaned up. But we got to catch them first, guys. I mean, yeah, I can point to some Marines right here in our church right now. When they first brought in, there's rough and a cob. But yet now that they've had the grace of God applied to their life and God began to change their life, they began to change their worldview, they began to change the way they looked at everything, and now everything's different in their life. And that, 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 that's all I'm saying. Don't, don't make me say more than I'm saying. I'm just saying that's a thought we need to look at. That means a stranger without good sense can find his way on the gospel road. Isaiah, 800 years before Jesus came, he, he told us that. Salvation is so simple and I'm preaching this right before friend day to get you to understand this. It's simple and plain. And oftentimes the intellectual giants stumble over it while little children have no trouble. Right? Little six-year-old hears it and says, you know what? I believe that. I believe Jesus. But you have a full bird colonel walk in and he has trouble with it. Or the professor down at the university, he has trouble with it. See, I had a guy, an old preacher, tell me one time, and by the way, and, I, and don't, don't you run, you smart at mouse, before I get done. He said, preacher, I just got my first doctorate. And he felt compelled he needed to tell me this. He said, by the way, y'all, I got three doctors. You can tell it too, can't you, by, by listening to me. But he said, preacher, he said, uh, feed the rabbits. He said, the giraffes can get down and get it. He said, but if all you do is try to feed the giraffes, the rabbits are going to starve to death. That old man had a little bit of truth, so therefore, I've just become a good rabbit feeder. And you giraffes, just bend your knee a little bit. You can get it if you just bend your knee a little bit. Okay. Now, it's simple. 
We adults are guilty of churning the crystal stream, a clear stream of salvation into muddy waters. And that's where my text, that's where my title comes from. We make something that's clear muddy. We confuse people and, and cause people to doubt. Ask Jesus into your heart, say a prayer, live right. The end. We don't have to debate soteriology. We don't have to debate the gifts of the Spirit. We don't have to debate, oh, well, we'll talk about that stuff later. We don't need to worry about who Cain's wife was or what happened to the dinosaurs. Uh, you, you understand what I'm saying? And that, that's all these questions come up. But wait a minute, we'll talk about that later. But right now, let's talk about Jesus. Amen. Let's talk about you getting your heart right with God. Let the dust settle and, and fish with clarity. I was fishing out here one time. I was holding revival for Rudolph Outlaw. I, I'm sure some of you guys know Rudolph. And, and, and I, I was out preaching for Rudolph. And he said, you want to go floundering after church? Well, I've never been floundering. I didn't know what a flounder was. We had perch and bass and crappie and catfish in Oklahoma, but didn't have no flounder. You know, all of our, our fish, you know, had eyes that looked, you know, normal. But, I mean, if I'd have saw one of them in Oklahoma, I'd have thrown it back because I said something wrong with this thing. You know, but we're floundering. We got our lights and our gigs. So, man, I see one of them things, and I'm, Boy, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm tearing the water. Man, I, I'm gigging that thing, and, and, and man, the, the water just becomes muddy, just a muddy mess. And Rudolph has got red in the face. I know you can't imagine that. He said, Curtis, he said, quit muddying up the water. We're trying to fish here. You can't see them if the, if the, if the water's muddy. Well, I'm afraid we as the church have done a little of that. Yeah. We've muddied up the water where these fish we're trying to catch. I mean, we've muddied the water. It's simple. Simple. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, he said, Thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and hath revealed them unto babes. Isn't it amazing how much stuff there is about this? It's hid to the wise. You remember 1 Corinthians, he, he talks about that. He said, not many wise after the flesh, or not many noble. He said, but God had chosen the, the, the foolish things of this world. And then he says, yea, and, and base things. And yea, things that are not to bring to naught the things that are. I love that, that verse. When I got saved, I got out of the ditch. I went and started telling people about getting saved. I told my mom and dad I got saved, told my Sunday school teacher that didn't give up on me. I started making restitution for stuff I'd done when I was lost. I did all that the same night, buddy. That all happened the same night. But mama's told me this after my daddy died. She said, we was all sitting around there, and she said, she's talking about the night I come in and told him I got saved. And, 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 and when I was going back out the car to, to go make the rest of my rounds, uh, Daddy said, uh, Rain, he said, if that boy makes a preacher, it'll have to be the Lord. <laughs> he was a prophet. Because if anybody does anything, it's going to have to be the Lord. Amen. But God says, I didn't call the mighty. I didn't call the wise. I didn't call the noble. He said, but base things, and th yet things that are not, nobodies. To bring to, that's why we have the days like Friend Day coming up. That nobodies, that's us. I got a sermon I preached, the army of the are nots. Kind of sounds like a monster movie or something, but the army of the are nots. That's who we are. We're a bunch of are nots that because of God's grace, he says, and things that are not to bring to naught the things that are. And then he said this, so that no flesh should glory in his presence. The flesh don't get the glory. God gets the glory. And if we do anything here at First Church, you know what? It's all because of him, not because of us. 
We understand. But it's simple. It's simple. Don't muddy the waters. I mean, he, God doesn't put a, a premium on ignorance nor a penalty on intelligence. But he does indeed stress the simplicity of salvation. God wants people to be saved. 1 Peter 3, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's not playing keep away with salvation. He wants you to be saved even more than you want to be saved. He went a million miles to make it happen and only stopped one set short because you've got to make that step. Well, then let's look at the meaning of salvation. I want to hold you past time tonight. What time is it right now? I can't see the clock. Somebody tell me. Be honest. It's what? 735. 7.35. Well, we're in good shape. Number one, the meaning of salvation. You saying the preacher, we all know. Well, let's, it won't help. Hey, it, it, it won't hurt us to rehearse it a little bit tonight before friend day. What must I do to be saved, the guy said. What must I do to be saved? Well, first of all, we have a misunderstanding of the word saved. What does it mean to be saved? The Greek word means, it, 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 it's sozo. It means to be delivered. But delivered from what? What was the Philippian jailer wanting to be delivered from or saved from? Some say, well, the dude was wanting to be delivered from the earthquake. No, the earthquake's over. Some say he wanted to be saved from his superiors who would kill him since the prisoners escaped. No, the prisoners didn't leave. They didn't run away. They all stayed put. So that wasn't what he's afraid of. He said, what must I do to be saved? Well, saved from what? Delivered from what? We give the invitation at the end of the message to invite lost people to be saved. You've heard that all your life. But saved from what? The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's a Bible word. But from what? Let's allow an angel to answer the question. When an angel announced the birth of Jesus to Joseph and Mary... He said, thou shalt call his name Jesus. I just love saying that name, don't you? Amen. Woo! Just call his name Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sins. To be saved means to be saved from sin. Now, people don't like that word saved anymore in our generation especially the younger folks and even below us baby boomers. They find it offensive. I've told you about flying back. I, I was sitting up in first class flying somewhere with this, this uh, well-to-do young businessman that lived there in Tulsa. And on, on the way on the plane, we got to talking about life and about kids and about everything. We finally got to church. He said, I said, where do you go? Of course, I'm always going to ask, man, where do you go to church? Well, he told me. And I knew right then as soon as he told me. And then he began to tell how he led a Bible study in a bar. Every Thursday night, they had a Bible study in a bar. I said, do y'all uh, drink at that Bible study? He said, yeah, we throw back a few. He said, and we think we're getting close to winning the bartender. And I know some of you may not be on that same page, but let, let, me, let me tell you that rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. And then some of y'all are saying, who's Paul Harvey? But anyway, people don't like the word sin. He said, you know why I don't go to your church? I said, no, tell me. He said, because my generation don't like somebody to tell them that they're wrong. My generation don't like people telling them what to do. So really. So the conversation kind of went south from there, but can anybody here remember when drunkenness was a sin? 
I mean, really, don't, don't, don't kid with me here. Can you remember when, it, when it, drunkenness was a sin? But now it's a disease. Before I got saved, I used to take a lot of them germs. Y'all remember that when pregnancy out of wedlock was a sin? You can remember when not being married and living together was a sin? Can anybody remember that far back? But now we just change the way we label it. Now listen, don't you burr up at me. We've all got people in our family. Listen, we're all dealing with all kinds of people in our family. But listen, I want, I want you to understand this. Understand me. And I, I'm saying it real nice. Just because I've got a nephew that says he's a homosexual don't mean that being a homosexual is okay. That's right. And they, I love him. And just because I've got a brother-in-law that, that likes the, the bottle don't mean it's okay. And just because I've got a good friend that commits adultery doesn't mean that it's okay. I, and I want you to understand that, that, that what thus saith the Word of God is what's important. Uh, we, I mean, children rebellion, uh, you, it used to be called a sin, but, but now it, 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 it's called maladjustment. By the way, if some of y'all will see me after service, I'll show you where the adjuster's located. <laughs> Shacking up is now cohabitation. Used to be a sin. Abortion is now freedom of choice. Used to be a sin. Homosexuality is now an alternative lifestyle. Adultery is now an affair. That sounds so sophisticated, doesn't it? Huh? Oh, we're ha having an affair. Here's a good one. Gossip used to be a sin. But now we've turned it into a prayer request. Oh, doesn't the truth hurt sometimes? Yeah. Really? I mean, pray, you pass somebody to pray, passing it down the prayer chain. By the way, I'm for the prayer chain. I'm for it. Uh, and, and, and I'm even for putting a prayer request on Facebook. If you've got somebody hurt and needing a need. But, but then when, when you see the eyebrows raise up and you, and you hear, really? Okay, I won't say any more. That didn't go over good. You remember Willie Nelson before the IRS caught him? back when he still had a bunch of money. He built his own golf course on his own land. Someone asked him about par. Some of you guys are golfers. Ask him about par and explain it. They asked what par was on his course. He said, it's my golf course and par is what I want it to be. He pointed at the first hole. He said, that's a par 47. He said, yesterday I birdied it. Well, that's how people approach sin these days. That's about as smart as how some people are approaching sin. Preacher, you've got from off track now. You was doing real good. Now they think they can just define sin for themselves. No, friend, the Bible has already defined sin. Amen. Oh, he's defined it a whole lot more clearly. Hey, oh, the Bible's a general book. Oh, buddy, I'm going to tell you something. It's way too specific for me. Because yeah. I read the Bible, I find out there's a lot of areas I ain't measuring up in. The Bible plainly tells us. A lot of people approach sin these days. They think they can just define it for themselves. Never mind what God says. They, they just feel it's okay. They feel it's okay. It's secular humanism. And no matter what evil happens in this world, the talking heads are all over the TV saying that these people aren't wicked. They're just sick. They're not evil. They're just sick. Yes, they're sick all right. They're sin sick. And so are we. Before you start looking with your pharisaical eyes, so are we. All have.
have sin. Preach, you did not talk bad about my, my, my grandson. They, no, I all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All we like sheep have gone astray. All, 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 every one of us. There's none that good that doeth good on the earth. No, not one. The Bible points out the very root of the problem, and he calls it sin. We're born with the sin nature. We aren't born with a spark of divinity. We're born with seeds of rebellion. That's the bad news. But the good news is Jesus Christ came to the world to save us from our sin. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to save us from our sin. Well, saved from three things as it pertains to sin. Let, let me hit those real quick before I let you go. Number one, saved from the penalty of sin. Romans 6, 23 says, for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. Apostle Paul calls it the, 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 the body of this death in Romans, this sin nature we live in. In ancient Rome, they killed criminals in several gruesome ways. Crucifixion was horrible, bad way, the way they crucified our Lord. They, they'd throw them to wild animals. And, and another way, they could, when convicted of a capital crime, many were executed by being attached to a cadaver, a dead body. Y'all ever read that in your studies? They would, attack, they, would, they would attach a dead body to, to somebody, usually someone that died of a loathsome disease like leprosy. They'd attach that dead body to them. They would tie the corpse to the back of the criminal who was required to work, eat, and sleep with that dead body tied to them. As that dead body decayed and decomposed, the disease would then overtake the criminal who would then die a slow, agonizing, humiliating death attached to a cadaver. You say, well, okay, it's a good story. How does that apply to us? The Bible says we all have this body of death tied to us. Every last one of us do. We're a spiritual being partaking in a physical journey. But, but, but so, so here we are, spiritual beings. We're carrying around this body of death, this body of corruption. It's tied to us. It's called sin. But praise God, Jesus came to save us from the penalty of sin. Number two, Jesus also saves us from the pollution and the power of sin. When we got saved, the Lord says, I don't only keep you out of hell, what most people think they're saved from in total. That's the way most people interpret the word saved. But I give you a new nature. He said, I'll save you from hell, but I'll also give you a new nature. I'll clean you up on the inside out. I'll give you power to get victory over the bad stuff, over your bad habits. I'll give you victory to learn a better way to live. I'll give you power to how to get rid of the things that don't belong in your life. I'll give you the power to replace them with better things. Praise God. Hey, sounds good to me. Hey, when I first got saved, I crawled out of that ditch and I was saved. But you know what? I went to work the next, the next week and remember one clarity. I, we was hauling rock on Interstate 40. Me and another guy about my age and we had a guy driving a backhoe and we was hauling rock and we'd bust them with a sledgehammer and throw them in the backhoe and, and if, if you go, there's a 13 mile stretch on Interstate 40 where we connected the east to the west. That was that 13-mile stretch in Oklahoma where they got connected. We were working on that last 13 miles. There is not a rock any bigger than that anywhere in that 13 miles. Guarantee you. That's what we did. We saw a rock that big. We busted it up, put it in, a, and hauled it off. Well, one day, I picked up a rock. Of course, I'm a young, stout boy, and I saw him, this rock was like that big. So I picked it up, and then it slipped, 
and my finger got caught between it and the other rock. Now, I did not say hallelujah. Because I'd only been saved two days. I said some bad stuff. But you know what? As soon as I did, here's the good part. As soon as I did, the Holy Ghost said, hey, you ought not to say that no more. Amen. And I said, God, I'm sorry. And I turned around the old boy that was there working with me, trying to win. I said, hey, I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. I'm trying to live right. And I, 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 I did a bad thing there, and I'm sorry. Well, listen, you can cut that whole arm off right there today. And listen to me, I ain't going to cuss. You say, you sure? I'm sure. I'm not going to take God's na name in vain. You can cut my arm off, and I'm not going to take God's name in vain. There's other things I had to grow into. There's other things that I had. But, but understand, the process was started, and God gave me. But that's what sanctification is all about, friends. Right. That's what we grow in God's grace and knowledge. And, and every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before, right? I mean, that's what it's all about. So he gives us power to save us from the pollution and the power of sin. Now, years ago, a man in England was in prison, but he is pardoned by the queen. A friend delivered the message to him saying, I've got great news. You've been pardoned. You can go free. His prisoner friend showed no emotion, didn't do nothing, didn't get up. He said, don't you understand? The queen has set you free. He unbuttoned his shirt, drew it back, revealed a large cancerous growth on his chest that was eating away his life. Ask the queen what she can do about this. Folks, it's not enough for us to be saved from just the penalty of sin. We also got to be saved from the pollution and the power of sin. Not just the sin that will send us to hell, but the sin that will continue to wreck our lives right now. I believe there's people that are saved that are doing stuff that's going to mess their life up. Come on now. Anybody ever know of a saved man that messed, made some mistakes and messed his life up? You ever know a saved man that didn't do right by his family? Yeah. Oh, and our answers say, well, well, he wasn't saved. That's not your job. He's made mistakes. He's done wrong. And by the way, it's not just the sweet by and by. It's the nasty now and now that we're living in. No wonder the author of Rock of Ages wrote this. He said, be of sin, that double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. The Bible, calls, the Bible says sin shall no longer have dominion over you. Sin won't be your master. Sin won't be your ruler no more. That's good. And anybody here know what I'm talking about? Yeah. There was a time when habits ruled my life. That dope, that liquor, that cigarette, and the list could just keep going on and on and on. That reefer. had dominion over me. But praise God, they don't have dominion over me no more. Amen. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you. There's no sin that you cannot gain victory over by the power of Christ. And somebody here needs to hear that tonight because I'm talking about your sin, your besetting sin, your problem, your need. But I'm telling you, there's no sin that you cannot gain victory over by the power of Christ. Amen. Yet some of us continue to be led around by the nose, by the booger man himself. Y'all got that nose and booger? And, and, okay. <laughs> and you think you have no control over it. Old devil just leads you around. Old, old devil just leads you around by the nose with that habit you've got, but, but that thing that's got to control, whether it be lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, or the pride of life, the old devil just leads you around, and you just follow right along like you ain't got good sense. And you think you have no control over it. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus has broken the power of sin in your life, and you need to claim the victory and say, enough is enough. 
There's somebody in this room tonight needs to say, enough is enough. I'm claiming victory today in something in your life. You got anything in your life that needs to go away? You say, how did this message get to this? Man, thou shalt be saved. I'm going to stop there. He gives us power over sin. I mean, all this is wrapped up in what he told power of the penalty of sin, power over from the pollution and, and, and power of sin. And, and, and one of these days we'll be saved from the very presence of sin. And why I'm stopping right there, because I, I need a little bit more time on that. One day, one day we're going to be saved from the very presence of sin. And won't that be a good day? I don't have to battle sin no more. I don't have to battle my lust. I don't have to battle my lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. I don't have to battle my pride. I don't have to battle my ego. Ain't that going to be a good day? And I'm looking forward to that, but I'm looking forward to preaching on that here. But maybe tonight in this little old Bible study, Maybe God spoke to your heart tonight about something. Philippian jailer, yeah, he was an old tough sinner. But you know what? We're all sinners. All of us are. Maybe tonight there's something in your life that you need to be free from. Maybe you're here tonight and you're not, you're not saved. You need to get right with God. Maybe tonight you, you got saved years ago, but you backslid on God. By the way, that's a Bible word. Maybe you backslid on God. You need to come rededicate your life to God. Or maybe, maybe tonight you're just somebody that you're just struggling with some things. He said, Preacher, I'm not struggling with lust of the flesh. No, but you may be struggling with trust. Anybody here ever struggle with trusting the Lord and, and lean, leaning on the Lord and not leaning on yourself? Uh, hey, oh, yeah, well, you, well, a preacher gets up and preaches on adultery and, you know, and drunkenness and all kinds of stuff. But you know what? Sometimes we struggle with trusting the Lord in our life. I felt led to say that, so somebody here needed to hear that. Somebody here tonight is having trouble with trust. How is it that we can trust God with our eternal soul, but we can't trust God for getting us through tomorrow? I can trust him to save me from hell, but I can't trust him to help me raise my family. Why is that? I don't know your needs tonight. Holy Spirit does, though. And maybe the Holy Spirit's speaking to somebody's heart tonight. Let's bow our heads just for a moment. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, nobody's looking. Is there somebody here tonight with just by an uplifted hand say, Preacher, God spoke to my heart about something. And I wish you'd pray with me. Not pray for you, pray with you. About this, what God spoke to my heart about tonight. Would you slip your hand up, slip it right back down. Preacher, God spoke to my heart about something. God spoke to my heart about something. Please pray for me. God bless you. Somebody else? God bless you. Somebody else? Preacher, that's me. I, I need the power over the penalty of sin, the pollution and power of sin. Oh, God, I, I, need, I need the same power that was given to that Philippian jailer. Anybody else? Last call. We're going to pray. You want to be included? God, you know our hearts, you know our needs, every one of us. We play the part well. We know how to do that. We know the churchy lingo. We know the churchy look. But sometimes, God, we're not honest with ourselves and with you. God, there may be someone here not saved, someone here that's backslidden, someone here, Lord, that sin is their master. The devil's leading them around the no by the nose. And he's got his hooks in them. He's their master. 
He has dominion over them. God's help somebody come and be set free from that. We'll wait for a few minutes if you need to come. Wherever you are, whoever you are, would you come? God speak to your heart about something. You need help with something in your life, here's where to get it. Start at the source of help, and his name is Jesus. Would you come? Appreciate you being here tonight. Look up here if you would. Listen, friend day, just a few instructions I want to give you. Uh, we can use all the help we can get on Saturday. What time y'all going to meet up here? 12 o'clock. Okay, because Lynette don't get up till 1130, so we got, we got to wait till 12. Come in, done and me for my money a while ago. Good for her. Uh, anyway. If you hadn't fit, signed up on the list, you've waited this long, uh, sign up. By the way, uh, when we come Sunday, we, we'd like for you to, to pull around to the back door of the gym. We'll have people that have already volunteered that said they will help carry food in. We'll have roller carts. Pull up there quickly, drop your food off. We'll get the food the right place. Go and park. We'll have people here that t telling you where to park. We're going to be parking over the Chamber of Commerce again. Uh, we'll have to be parking out on the fields, but we'll have people that will help you with that. And, uh, and uh, by the way, I would ask, by the way, the choir, you do have to stay up there uh, Sunday. And by the way, you people that are regular people, if you see us like last year start filling up, we have overflow rooms set up with televisions that I would ask you to go to. Let's not make lost people go to the overflow room. Okay, let, let's, let's go. And then altar call time comes. I want you to come back and work the altars. But anyway, uh, a lot of stuff going on. Uh, be here, lend a helping hand. And by the way, you've only got four more days. You need to be busy calling, 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 texting, Facebooking, uh, bribing, uh, offering money, whatever you got to do to get them here for this one day to hear the gospel. I promise you I'll keep it, I'll keep it simple. I promise you that, that when they leave here, they'll understand what I said, and hopefully the Holy Spirit's going to do his work, and we're going to have a lot of people saved. So let's, let's remember this. Get geared up for it. I need to meet with all the deacons right after church in my office. Don't pass go. Don't collect $200. Go directly to my office, okay? All right, any other? Y'all got any instructions? Lynette, you got any other instructions? Lynette's always got to throw a kink in everything we do. Yes, we, we'd already discussed that. April's even got to go do nursery after she plays the piano. So we're, yeah. If, if, by the way, if, if you're signed up to do some of this stuff, uh, yeah, you can leave the choir. If you say, Mother, may I? Okay. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Get busy. Get busy. we just got four more days. Ever restaurant, ever gas attendant, ever clerk, everybody you see needs to have a track in their hand. Tell them about what's going to happen. We want to get them here. And by the way, everybody here, if you can, please make it. Please try to make it here for friend day. Okay? This week. All right.